Joe Mazumdar of Exploration Insights joins us now at the Minds of Money conference in Toronto. Joe, welcome back to our show. Thank you very much. Anna. You're a speaker here at Minds of Money, and uh, I want to ask you, since you might have more of an objective voice here than some mining CEOs. Everybody's opinion is uh, objective. Right. <laughs> um, about something Ian Telfer said in his talk earlier, how the industry is running out of gold. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I guess it depends on the gold price that the, uh, that the gold is being measured at. If uh, gold is going from where it is now, 1250 to 1300 to 1500, then I think that a lot of the uh, bigger companies have marginal ounces that they've taken out of reserves over the last few years that they could bring back. Uh, but if, if he's thinking that the gold price is going to stay at these levels, I absolutely agree that there's not enough quality ounces that work at these gold prices. So are juniors going to play a more vital role now more than ever, Joe? Because if the majors aren't looking for the deposits, actively looking, uh, you know, how vital are the juniors now? So we've seen like a 20% decline uh, compound annual growth since 2012 peak in exploration expenditures in gold. And, and, and with that decline, uh, the, the, if you look at just as Barrick, uh, you know, at, at the peak of, of, let's say, if you take exploration as a proportion of revenue, they spent almost 8% at what point. Now they're spending like 3 to 4%, and that's about their GNA. So right now, if big companies consider exploration like GNA and they flatline at that level, most of their exploration is going to brownfields, not grassroots. So to Mr. Telfer's point, if you want to find gold deposits that work at your 1200 and 1250, you're going to have to find new deposits, and that's grassroots. And grassroots exploration as a proportion of exploration expenditures for gold has been declining since 2003. They're not doing it. So there's a perfect opportunity for juniors that know what they're doing in the jurisdictions that majors want to be is a perfect opportunity for joint ventures and earnings, and that's what we've been seeing that the majors have been doing. They've been taking their exploration dollars and now investing in juniors. Like, I've done that before when I was with Newmont in corporate development, but now I think it's ratcheted up. So, is the, as an investor, um, is this a really good opportunity to make a lot of money then, in, in looking at picking some of well, these juniors? I, well, the thing is, that it's, it's a nice stamp of approval on a play to get it, uh, yeah. to, to see a major involved, but you can have different types of involvements. One is a little bit more, more active and one's passive. So if we take ATAC resources, uh, uh, you know, they've got this big Carlin trend, district scale land package, in uh, the Yukon. And, uh, you know, they had a private placement quite a few years ago with Agnico. They got a bit of a bump from that, and then it just didn't go anywhere. And right now, I think they're more appreciative of the Barrick placement, which is much more active in the joint venture, giving okay. them an active participation. Well, that's, that's a really good point you're bringing up. So just because someone has, let's pretend, a 10% stake in a company, if a major takes a 10% stake in a junior, doesn't necessarily mean that the next step is a buyout. No, I mean, Agnico proved that when they did their placement in Rubicon, you know, they, they, they kept with it and when it didn't look good, they, they, for them, they pulled out. So it, it's a positive initially, but it could be more of a negative when they pull out. It's a way for them to test the waters without exactly. going all in. And, and I think their investors, uh, like if you look at uh, the uh, Newmont placement in Continental, you know, a, a very significant yeah. placement in a company, in a jurisdiction, they don't work. But if they went out and bought Continental, then they're trying to feel out the deposit, how it's going to work, how we're going to, you know, advance it and understand Columbia all at the same time, whereas they take a little, you know, 19.9% interest, understand Columbia a little bit more, and then when they do make the purchase, it's, it's, it's a lot less risky to them. In the end, it might be a little bit more expensive yeah. or not, but but it's definitely a lot less risky. Finally, what's, uh, what's your gauge here, Joe? Uh, you think the mining, I mean, apart from the fact that we're not doing gra enough grassroots exploration and you know, perhaps there is a metal shortage here at these prices, yeah. uh, do you feel good about the industry? Do I feel good cool about the industry? Uh, I mean, uh, I would guess right now for us, it's difficult to find grassroots explorers uh, that are uh, uh, like uh, well-valued in terms of a risk reward ratio. We, we, what we're seeing, like I did a little uh, a, a survey of about 14 companies that have done really well on drill intersections or something like that. And so uh, the average of these 14 companies offered a return of 260% over two months, you know, up to 950%. Yeah. And some of these guys are trading, 
much higher than the than the ongoing risk that that could happen with a, with a bad drill hole or something like that. So for us, it's difficult to find those projects that right now in a risk reward ratio makes sense to invest in. Joe, say hi to Brent Cook for me. Uh, thank always. you so much for coming on. Okay, thank you very and much. Thanks for watching our coverage here from the Minds of Money conference in Toronto. Thanks, Joe. Thank you.